on a Friday. But anyhow, we're covering John chapter 13 from verse, um, John chapter 13, from John chapter 13 all the way through um, Acts chapter 7 today. All right, so just kind of follow along with me here. So in John chapter 13, we, um, you know, here I thought it was a really great way to um, open up, or at least for me, to open up this um, QBIV. Um, basically, we learn about, you know, love and service and betrayal and de denial in the same um in the same chapter. So Jesus starts out, you know, this is where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And um, one thing that stuck to me was verse one of chapter 13 at the end. It says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them till the end. To the end. And that just tells me like the love of Christ, you know, for us is it wasn't just at that point, right? When he, um, or for the assignment, it's till the end for eternity. So just be reminded of the love of Christ. Um, and then we see there that Jesus, um, he does this, this extra, uh, this, um, I think probably one of the biggest, aside from actually, um, you know, dying on the cross for us, this extraordinary act of service where he performed this tax that normally then right people will wear sandals like he, I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen renditions of, of of those ages where people will wear sandals that most of their feet would get covered in dust and sand and so it was the servant it was the um a servant or a slave's job right to wash the feet uh, of the servants but Jesus came he girded his loins and he um he did this task for his for his, um, he washed the feet of his servants. And, you know, at some point it was a Peter that said, Lord, you will not wash my feet. And Jesus there, you know, being the greatest, I mean, he was, he was their master, essentially. He, he humbled himself and he was doing that, not just to be, oh, okay, look, this is what, um, you know, I can do this, uh, but he was setting an example for all of us to serve, right? So, you know, again, the, the premise, the, the, the point of Jesus coming was to serve, right? To serve humanity by giving his life. So Jesus sets this pattern for his, um, for his disciples. And he says that, do you know what I have done to you? And he says, um, then if I have, if I then Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now I know Sister Jodian and Sister Ray are not walking in on, on sandal. They're not walking on, on dusty roads, right? Uh, <laughs> at least not on this part of this world, in this side of the world. But what does that mean for us? It means like we are to serve one another, right? However, whatever that means, we need to humble ourselves. Sometimes um, we talked about, we've started talking about being selfless this month, right? In Bible study on Wednesdays, but just putting ourselves, emulating Christ. He says, as I have done, he says, actually in verse 15, he says, well, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So we need to humble ourselves to serve others. It's not always about me, 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 what I can get out of it. Oh, I'm too, you know, I'm too, um, what is the word, is it push or whatever, bougie or whatever you call it, to um, to clean the church or to do this task. Nothing is too small. If Jesus can perform that task, then he, um, he has definitely um, made it okay for us to humble ourselves and and, and serve others. And one thing that also stuck to me in that scripture, in that chapter was uh, verse 17, um, where he, he says to them, if you know these things, right? I said to you, um, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do that. So that tells me it's not enough for us to know, right? We always pray, you know, like in, in James, don't be a hearer of the word alone, be a doer. The blessing is actually in doing. So we've been learning about, we've been learning a ton, right? Um, but we need to practice, a reminder to practice what we, what we learn. It's not enough to know. The blessing is in the doing. And of course, um, later on in that script, in that same chapter, he introduces, this is where he actually introduces the new commandment, right? In verse 34, he says, love one another as I have loved you, right? Love one another. He commands them, right? To love one another um, just as he does, right? Again, serving one another. What does that mean? Serving one another, um, emulating Christ essentially. And, um, and it says there in verse 35 that by this, all will know. Every other Christian will know, the entire world will know that you are my disciples. If you love, if you have love 
one for another. Okay, not if you have respect one for another, it's if you have love one for another. So love is truly the proof of, it's the proof of a true Christian, one who is a disciple of Christ, love. If you're trying to measure, okay, am I a really good Christian? Then you should say, what is the measure of the love that I give to others? Do I love others as Christ loved um, or loves us or loves me? All right. And then John chapter um, chapter 14, one way Jesus, um, Sister Jody Ann, that comes to mind. You're the only one that I will live for. Yeah, that comes to my mind because my kids are always playing that. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, no one comes to the Father except by him, right? It says that in, in verse 6. Um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So last month, we were talking about the highway of holiness. We talked about um, the, you know, the difference between holiness and righteousness, right? Righteousness is what Christ came to do to, um, as believers, you know, you are made righteous, but holiness um, is, you know, that way, right? That we talk about the highway to holiness. So I like to think of it as the entrance ramp to that highway of, hol of holiness is Jesus. Jesus, you cannot get to God. You cannot see God without, um, without first accepting Jesus and staying on that highway of holiness. Um, he goes on in chapter 14 to tell us about oneness. Jesus um, reiterates this. He talks about the father. He says, do you know, um, you know, telling his disciples, do you know the father? If you know me, you know my father. And Philip says, well, we know you. So, you know, show, show us the father. And then he basically just talks about, you know, I and the father are one. Love me. If you love my father, um, love me. My father will love you um, and we'll make our home with you. Basically, um, I think it jumps around in a couple of, yeah, in, in verses 19 to 24, um, talking again about that. And what I got out of that is, you know, proof that you love God is obeying him. I, I you know, proof that you love God is obeying him. That's a, a theme that kind of um, resonated with me as I went through that. Also in that chapter 14, um, we talked Jesus, you know, promises another helper. He promises the Holy Spirit, who is our helper, right? Um, and he was telling them all these things because he's telling them, hey, guys, I'm, I'm about to leave. You know, I'm getting ready to leave. So these are the things that are going to happen. Um, so the Holy Spirit says, told, tells them that the Holy Spirit will come. He will dwell with you and in you forever. So as, as believers, we should just, we should really um and and that's we should really practice this practice the reality the the um presence of the holy spirit throughout our day he's not just someone who is in us right i have received the holy spirit the baptism of the holy spirit but the holy spirit is present with you all through your day wherever you go so practice that and he also tells them that he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance um all things right so holy spirit is our teacher he's our helper and to the disciples, it was telling them that because, you know, bring to your remembrance all things, all the things that I've discussed with you, all the things that I've shared with you, that I've imparted upon you. But to us these days, yes, the Holy Spirit will remind us of the word of God, what God has said. He will teach us um, also. So if you're having any, um, you know, just to be practical, right, um, we you can, you can practice that throughout your day, right? You, you come across a situation or, or a challenge in your day-to-day -day life, even at work. I remember that Pastor Tune, I think Pastor Kola shared that recently. He was at one day in Atlanta um, with a job, uh, with, a, and with a company. He had no idea. He was like, yes, I'm going to take it on. And he had no idea. And literally just like bowed down his head and asked the Holy Spirit to teach him. And boom, like he just like completely had that revelation. So let's practice, we should really practice that. The Holy Spirit is not one abstract um, person, right? Which he's really in us and with us forever. All right, I'm gonna try and pace myself. All right, and 15, John chapter 15, right? This is the big one about the true vine, right? So we hear about Jesus. So Jesus is the true vine, right? God is the vine dresser and we are the branches. The first thing that says that said here is that every tree in verse two, every branch in me, right, that does not bear fruit, he will cut off. It will be cast out, withers away, burnt in the fire. It talks about later. So that there, that so that means it's possible to be in Christ, 
and not be fruitful. And one thing I left out here when we're talking about fruitful, like, well, what fruit are we talking about? Galatians 2, right? The fruits of the spirit, is it five? Um, the fruits of the spirit. So there, there has to be an evidence as believers, as one that are that is joined to Christ. There has to be an there has to be evidence that we are indeed joined to him. And that is the fruit that he's talking about. So it's possible to be a believer, right? And not bear fruit. But that's not what God called us to do. God called us, had chosen and appointed us to bear fruit. And when you bear fruit, um, it's when you're fruitful. So there's a fruitful branch, right? That is pruned so that what? It could bear more fruit, right? We always, just like the perfecting, we, we heard about that a lot last month, perfecting your holiness, right? Perfecting that walk of holiness. So as you bear, as you bear fruit, you, you, um, God will prune you. He will take away those things that are limiting your growth. Those, um, those things that can stunt your growth in him. But what is the, what the true, the key, the key, the main, um, the, the main, um, the main, the main, however you want to say for bearing fruit is really abiding in Christ, right? Just because you cannot look at a tree. You cannot, if you take the branch away from the actual, um, I, I have not been in a vineyard, but if you take, just look at let's use a regular tree, take a, the, a branch away from the main um, tree itself, it cannot be fruitful. So in order for us to be fruitful, uh, we have to stay connected to Christ. We have to stay connected. Um, different examples, just like, you know, in order for you to have power to your appliance, your electronic appliance or whatever, you have to plug it in, right? You have to stay connected to him. Um, we're also reminded here to abide in his word, to let his word abide in us, right? Um, in, I think it's in Co um, Corinthians that it talks about putting on Christ, put on Christ, you know, feed on his word, let his word abide in you. Um, and, and when you do this, you begin to grow, right? Christ is the word of God himself. So when, when we, um, when we take time and spend time in the word of God, he, he begins to reveal things to us. He's, he begins to, um, you know, groom us rather so that we can bear more fruit. And also we have to abide in his love, right? So abide in Christ, let his word abide in you and abide in his love. Again, a recurring theme here is um, obedience is the proof of love. You love God, you do what he says. If you don't love him, um, if you say you love him, but you don't follow his um, instructions, well, that's no love at all. So again, a reminder here to just stay connected to God um, and keep his word. And um, let's see, um, one of the last things I said here um, in, in verses 18, 18 down, it talks about, you know, the world, the world's hatred, right? The world hated Christ for no reason at all. And he's telling them that, hey, you know, the time is going to come. And we'll see that, right, in the coming, in the coming chapters in the book of Acts that, there will be persecution that you will suffer, you know, that people will hate you just because, just because you are mine, just because you're connected to me, but the Holy Spirit, the, the spirit of truth, you know, will come, will come and help you. So um, just a reminder, you know, you, for whatever reason, um, if you are trying to stand up for the truth, even you don't even have to be trying to stand up for the truth, just because people, um, not even people, the devil, right? Just because you are of God and you've determined, you've separated and dedicated yourself to God, the devil has basically put a target on your back, but you can't, you know, the Holy Spirit will help you to overcome so that the, 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 the plans of the enemy um, do not overcome you. All right. And then verse, verse, chapter 16, chapter 16, when Christ departs. So this is, again, Christ continues to tell them like, okay, guys, um, stay in my word, abide in me, you know, abide in the, in my love. Um, you know, the world's going to hate you, blah, blah, blah. And, but the Holy spirit is going to come. So he's telling them that, Hey, the Holy spirit is going to come. What is the Holy spirit going to do? The Holy spirit is going to convict. He's going to guide He's going to speak and declare, and he's going to glorify, that should say glorify God. So the Holy Spirit is going to come and convict the world, convict the, convict the world of it, the sins that they've committed, um, you know, and then convict of righteousness forfeited. And then he will judge the world, right? And those that reject him, he will judge. And then the, he tells there to, um, let me see. So he goes on in the, in the later chapters, in the later verses, rather, to talk about 
I'm now addressing the disciples in verse 12. It says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. So maybe you are in a situation in your life where you, you're like, okay, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's right from wrong. What is the way? It's the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth. Remember, he's your helper. He's your teacher. He will bring all things to your remembrance. The Holy Spirit will also speak and declare the Father's heart. Now, we know that the scriptures are inspired by the Holy Spirit. These are things that, that have been written down. But, you know, there are some de um, secrets, right, that's not written in the scriptures. There, th this is why it's important for us to, to abide in Christ, to abide in his word, to spend time in fellowship. Because there are some things that God has written, literally books about you, that you don't know, you don't see physically. But when you connect, when you engage the Holy Spirit, the revelations, those revelations that are not written in scriptures will be spoken to you and he will declare to you the father's heart. And of course, by when we engage the Holy Spirit, we, you know, we work with the Holy Spirit, our lives will glorify God. Again, at the end of that chapter, the, um, the Jesus tells them like, look, be of good cheer. You know, I have overcome the world for you. Things will come. Tribulations will come again. Reminder, these day and age, you, there seems to be attack on on believers, you know, different parts of the world, more areas than the other. But we should not be surprised because Christ, Christ told us that this is going to happen. So let's not be surprised, but know that God, um, that Christ has overcome at the end. God will judge, um, you know, he will judge the, the world, but, um, and he will, um, he will keep us. Okay. Us. So John chapter 17, and this is where um, Jesus prays. And it's, it's really important because um, it, it kind of, it sets the stage kind of for what happens next. But, and, and again, all these parts have been repeated in, in the previous um, books, but Jesus prays three uh, for three different sets of people in this chapter. In verses one through seven of uh, five, rather, Jesus prayed for himself. He prayed for himself, knowing what's to come, right? Because he's preparing his disciples, teaching them all these things. He says, I have a lot to tell you. I can tell you all these things. The Holy Spirit will tell you. He'll remind you, yada, yada. So he, he knows like the end is coming. And so he's praying for himself. And he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you. And he says, you, as you have given me authority over all flesh, um, that he should have eternal life, give eternal life as many as you have given him. Um, and then he says in verse four, he says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Now, in reality, Christ was praying this prayer, but he hasn't actually finished the assignment, right? Because he hadn't yet been crucified, but he was praying it. So praying also, when we pray, we're declaring the will of God, because that's the way, you know, praying the heart of the father is really the most potent prayer, praying his word. God had already, this is his assignment. So he's saying, essentially saying, God, I'm, going, I'm finishing that assignment. So his prayer was praying the heart and the will of a father, right? That his assignment, his prayer was focused on finishing his mission that God will be glorified. So when we're praying for ourselves, let's pattern again, Jesus is our ultimate example. We should always imitate him, emulate him. Um, we should pray, like our prayer should not be just God, give me this, give me that. You know, yes, Jesus, you know, probably pray for strength, but we hear here that he's praying to finish the assignment. So are we praying and say, constantly praying and saying, God, give me the grace to finish the work. Say, God, you know, I'm finishing the mission and everything that you have given me to do so that your name will be glorified in my life. And then next he prays. So it's important to pray for yourself. So we're talking about, you know, being selfless, but also love your neighbors as yourself. Jesus prayed for himself before he prayed for others, right? So we need to pray for ourselves. Um, his disciples, he prayed for his disciples. Do we pray for the people that we, like that that are under us in leadership? Do we pray for people in our in our homes? Um, do we pray for people that are you know in our community? We should do that. So here, Jesus in verses six through eight, Jesus acknowledges his stewardship. He's like, wow, the people that you have given to me. He says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. So this Jesus is not saying, oh, these are my people. Thank you, Lord, for my people. He's saying, these are your people that you've given to me. A reminder that we are stewards, right? We are stewards here um, for God. So everything that we have, the people that we are serving, the people around us, in our families, in our homes, we are stewards of those relationships. We are stewards of those, um, that career, that business. 
So just remember to pray. Jesus prayed for his disciples. The number of things he says in, in verse 11, B says that Holy Father, keep through your name, those who am, you have given me, that they may be at one as we are. So he praises, keep them. It says again um, in verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from evil. So he was praying for protection. And then he lastly, he prayed to sanctify by them. It says, I sanctify my, it says, sanctify them by your truth. So when we pray again, Jesus is our, um, he's our role model, but we should always make sure that we cover those around us, those that we're serving in prayer. Um, it's so, so important. And lastly, of course, Jesus prays for all of us all. He prays for all you and I, he prays for the believers to come. He says, um, in verse 20, I do not pray for these alone. I'm not just praying for these disciples, but I'm praying for all those who will believe in me through their word. Believe it or not, we are here because those disciples obey that instruction and they spread the gospel. So Christ prayed for you and I before you were even born, right? Before you even came to know him. Um, and he prayed, what did he pray? He says that um, a lot of times, I mean, a rip, it was repeated. He prayed for unity with, with um, each other. Like we should be in unity. We should be united, like-minded, like, and then being unity um, and oneness with the son and the father. And it says, may they be made perfect in one that the world may know that you have sent me. Okay, so um, it's really important. Um, it was really important that, it, and it is important that we, um, as believers, be in one accord. And again, we'll see the relevance of that in the coming chapters. And he also prays for love. He says in verse 26, it says that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. So, you know, let's always pray for that. If Jesus prioritized that, if, those, if, those, if Jesus prayed for unity and he prayed for love, um, there's no reason why we shouldn't constantly pray for that, right? Like we, the love of the Father should be in us. We should be in one accord in our homes, with our children, with our spouses, in our place of work, because the spirit of God cannot flow where there's division. So as believers, particularly in his house, we should always pray for unity, uh, pray against every spirit of division. All right, moving on to chapter 18, betrayal, arrest, denial, and trial. Um, the Garden of Gethsemane. So I... Um, I, I remember, I think when the last time the, um, I think it was Sister Folu that, that ministered, she said, Jesus is, got, gets, he was his Gethsemane experience, right? Where he was praying um, that Lord, let this cup pass over me. Um, and here Gethsemane, the garden of Gethsemane is referenced again, right? In that place um, previously mentioned, I think also in the book of Luke, Jesus was praying, God, let this, if, if it's, I don't, I know what's coming, Lord, I don't want this, but let your will, not mine be done. Jesus was praying so hard. He was sweating. His blood was, his sweat was as thick as blood. We were told. And here we see that again referenced. And I liken the Garden of Gethsemane to Jesus's war room. This was like his prayer closet. Um, this was not referenced just once. It was referenced multiple times in the scripture. So even Jesus had a place where he went to go and pray. So we should always have that place. We, we can pray. Jesus prayed everywhere, but not to neglect the room of prayer, your war room. This is where you go and you engage the spirit of God. You let God show you the secret things that are to come so that you can prepare. And we see here that Jesus, um, and it makes sense. Now you look at um, chapter 17 and I was like, wait, he just prayed. And then all hell broke loose, right? He just prayed and then boom, everything just starts to happen. They come to arrest him, blah, blah, blah. But the point here is that if Jesus had not stayed, if he didn't stay prayed up, okay, when the time came, perhaps he would have been like, oh, I don't have the strength of boldness. My point here is that we should stay prayed up, right? When Jesus was praying, um, when Jesus prayed, he received, you know, he received the strength, right? He was weak at that point um, in, in the book of Luke when it was recorded that he was, he, he was, um, I forget the specific word, but he, he was like, essentially, I, I, if I could use the word dismayed or just groaning at what was to come, right? Like his flesh was literally weak, but he received the strength. He received the courage. He knew what was coming. And in verse four, chapter 18, we were told that um, Jesus knew Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him. Yes, you could say he was the son of God. He knew, but if he didn't, um, 
and Jesus also, we know that he, he spent time in the room of prayer. So things were revealed to him then. So he knew that things were going to come again. When you pray, when you stay in the word of God, when you stay in his presence, he begins to reveal things to you. He shows you what's, what's to come. He calls you with his strength. He gives you boldness, just like thinking back to Moses in Exodus chapter three, where in the, in the burning bush, he had that encounter with God and he stayed in the presence of God. This was a man who had no vision, no clue for his life. He was running away. And God gave him a purpose. God gave him strength. He empowered him and literally revealed to him what's to come. So again, the importance of having your own prayer time, of your time in the presence of God. And I put here, consistency in the room of prayer prepares you for anything, right? When you are consistent in your war room, um, you will always be battle ready. That was a typo. You will always be battle ready. So anything, you know, we should always be ready, right? Always, always be ready. Don't don't let, don't be caught on unprepared. So then we see that Jesus was arrested. And one thing that actually stood out to me, I didn't, I didn't notice this before in verse six, it says that, um, of course, one of them, the chief priest, what was it called now? Jesus, okay. So some people came, right? So troops, detachment of troops, officers from the chief priests and Pharisees came, you know, with their torches and such. And they answered and said, um, and Jesus said, whom are you seeking? And they answered and said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am he. And, and then now, and um, Jesus who betrayed him stood with them. And now he said to them, I am he. And guess what? They drew back and fell to the ground. I was just like, oh, oh wow. Okay. So they, they still honored him and recognized that even though they were fulfilling scripture. So that just kind of stood out to me. And um, the rest of the chapter, we see Jesus's trial, right? He was brought before the high priest. Um, and he was, um, he was brought before the high priest. And then Jesus not Jesus. Then Peter denies him, right? Peter, Peter denies him. Um, yeah. So Peter, Peter denies him. Um, and then Jesus, again, he's brought, you know, questioned by the high priest, Jesus, uh, Peter denies him two more times. And then of course this exchange happens with Pilate in chapters 35 to 36 verses 35 to 36. Um, and I really see the humility come through here in Christ um, where Pilate is saying, um, are you the king of Jews? And Jesus, you know, they, they go through this exchange. Well, are you speaking of yourself about this or did others tell you? And eventually Jesus says to him, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were in this world, my servants will fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not um, from here. And um, Pilate says in 37, there Pilate says, are you a king then? And Jesus said, you say rightly for I am a that I am a king for this cause I was born for this cause I have come to this world that I should bear witness to the truth. I'm reading that to say that Jesus at that point in time could have been like, you know what? I have the host of heaven at my disposal. I can just send them right now to turn things around, but he still humbled himself. He was purpose driven. He stayed focused on the assignment. Um, and of course he was, um, Pilate found him innocent, but still was judged guilty. And, uh, you know, was, they released Barabbas, uh, and, and took Jesus. Okay, going on. I think I'm, okay, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. So going on to chapter 19, journey to the cross. I'm sure we all know this story, right? Jesus was, um, he was arrested, he was bitten, he was mocked. Um, I mean, just all sorts, right? This is, if you read the other books, you get the fuller um, account. But, but it was really, um, I, it was really, it kind of took me to when growing up, I watched a lot of, you know, films and such. And I remember particularly the Passion of Christ when it was when I really appreciated the scourge when they were bitten him. And I, so I just thought I um, picture that out. He was scourged and scourge is not, um, I don't even think I really paid attention to that word before, but when I looked it up, it actually was a, it, it was something that they did and they would, um, take these scourge, they call them, right? These things. And I don't know if you see it there. Um, this, this was the weapon that they used and it had bones at the end of it. Of course, this is a crown right here, but these things will have stone, um, what do you call it now? Uh, bones. And so on this diagram here, you can see the drawing that they would basically, essentially like they did in that picture, tie him to that pole so that he doesn't move, right? Like when I, a couple of times when I had to spank my kid, they would run and there was no opportunity for him to escape this punishment, this cruelty. And they whipped him 39 times. Um, somewhere I read said, 
um, 30, 12, um, 39, 26 in the back or front, and then 12 in the chest or something like that. Well, this was meant not just to punish, but to, to really, um, to hurt the soul almost like to really, um, weaken you, weaken your spirit because each of that, um, each of those, uh, little bones going in tears, the flesh pulls it apart. So this is not like, oh, you know, you're getting whooped with a belt. This is like a deep tearing of the flesh and, you know, and, to anyone that that's that's sick you know that this is why jesus suffered that for your sake so that those who are are sick will know that by his stripes by those bitten that he took on his flesh you are healed and made whole um so just remember that of course um we see you know that then he was mocked you know they would say no if you are are you the king of jews yada yada crucify him and then he he finished the work the finished work of christ was um, was dying on the cross um, of Calvary. Um, I mean, it was just it was just really bad, really sad that they they um, they cast it locked to to um, divide his clothing and all of that. But Christ finished his assignment. He came. He finished his assignment. Just a a um, reminder to us all. Part of God doesn't reveal everything to us all at once. But just stay on the course. Find your purpose. Find God's will for your life. Stay through it. Some parts of it may not be pleasant. For Jesus, it wasn't. It was downright cruel. But he stayed and he finished. He stayed the course and he finished the work. And then, of course, he was glorified. He was given the name above every other name. So they thought they killed him. They buried him. But then he rose again. So in chapter 20, we see the... Um, <clears throat> we see that the Mary Magdalene and the others went to the tomb to look for Jesus. And when they were there, of course, when they got there, they didn't see Christ. They were like, the tomb was empty. And my mind, I'm thinking, well, did they, didn't they really know what Christ, did they forget what Christ had told them before, at least the other disciples, you know, maybe they didn't get it then. Um, and of course, so then they go and, and to tell the other disciples, but Mary was the first to see Jesus. Jesus appeared to Mary and then she runs off. But um, as they were gathering in that room, in that upper room, um, they were kind of shut behind the doors, right? They were afraid of the Jews because they just, they were the ones that were with Jesus. Jesus was not, he, they killed Jesus. So they were like locked up um, behind the closed doors, afraid. And then Jesus appeared to them. He appeared to them in verse 19. And Jesus said to them, peace be with you. And then he showed them his hands and, and his side. And I'm thinking, well, did it, is that, okay, let, let's go on before I, I get to that. So he, he, he shows them, he showed them his hands. Um, and the first, I guess they, they all didn't believe, right? Um, but they were glad to see him. They were glad to see him and Thomas. So when, when the word got out to Thomas, and he says, oh, no, unless I see his hands and the print of the nails on his hands, um, I wouldn't believe. I wouldn't believe. And Jesus, and I found, I found this picture. I thought it was really neat. Um, it shows you, like, literally, Jesus said, put your hand. He says, like, um, reach your finger here and look at my side and put your hand here. Just in case you think you're seeing a ghost. Here, touch. You know, touch. And I'm real. And um and Thomas said, Lord, my Lord, my God, wow, this is, this is real. And Jesus said to Thomas, um, because you have seen me, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet are, have believed. Are we, if God has said something, are we holding on to it? Are we believing it? Are we waiting to see? Are we waiting to see? Oh, God, just show me, show me, give me a hint. Like, <laughs> was it God? Uh, show me a sign. Show me a sign that it's truly you. Show me a sign that this is, I'm not saying it, it's bad, but let's just take God's word at um, um, hook, line, and sinker. Um, one thing that actually stood, stood out to me, I didn't uh, pick this up previously, was verse 22, where, um, you know, when Jesus said, and it says, and when he, that is Jesus, had said this, he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. He said, he just said that. That just kind of stood out to me there. But let's go on. Um, chapter 21. So this is the last, um, this is the last chapter in the book of John. And it reminded me of the book of Matthew. I believe it was in uh, Luke, the different accounts when Jesus called them, right? He called the fishermen, he called Peter. 
And here, of course, they've encountered Jesus. They know that he's the resurrected king, but they, they you know, they go out fishing, right? They go out fishing and they, um, and then when they saw this man, they didn't even know it was Jesus. Um, so wait, hold on. Yes. So he tells them again. So he tells them again, um, you know, they went fishing. He says, oh, cast your net on this right side. And they caught a multitude of fish. But this time, unlike previously, their net was not broken. Their net was not broken. Um, and at the late, and later on, Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yeah, none of the disciples dared ask, who are you? Why? Knowing that he was the Lord. So they had experienced him. They experienced his power. There was no need to question. There was no need to doubt. So for us, knowing God, really spending time with him, knowing his power, um, it, it eliminates every form of doubt in you. It gives you confidence. It gives you boldness that you need to go forward and, and, and fulfill that assignment. These people were called and commissioned earlier to go out there and be fishers of men. Yes, they were followers of Christ. They followed him all through all, all of that. But they really did start doing that until, you know, after this period here um, and in the next couple of chapters. Um, again, at the very, very end of chapter 21, Jesus calls Peter. Remember, this is Peter that denied Jesus three times. And I find it interesting that Jesus um, asked him, do you love me three times, right? Um, and um, he, he asks him, do you love me, Peter? He says, yes. Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Do you love me? And the guy must have been like, yes, I just told you I love you. But I guess he's just trying to make up for the denials. And he says, tend my sheep. And lastly, he said, he repeats again, do you love me? And he says, yes. John says, yes. I mean, Peter says, yes. And he says, feed my sheep. Um, a reminder, right? Look, this is my assignment. Feed, lead my people, lead my people. So for us, again, proof of love is obedience, right? This is what Jesus was honing in on that I got. And it's like, if we love God, we're going to, we're going to um, rise up to the occasion. We're going to rise up to our purpose, what God has called us to do, to obey and to persevere. There was a reason why, um, why Jesus repeated that. It wasn't just to be, you know, to, to, to be cool or whatever. He wanted to say, he wanted to um, just let him know, you can't, if you really love me, at least what I'm thinking here is when you, you say you love me, you're not going to cower it out like last time, right? You're not going to deny me. You're going to continue. So let's not abandon God's calling upon our lives. Let's persevere. Let's take care of what he has called us to tend. Let's, you know, let's feed, um, you know, our lambs, those people that are, um, that we're supposed to be feeding for, for God. And so we finish the book of John. Now we go, we go to the book of Acts and um, Acts is um, written by, by Luke. And um, this is, you know, Jesus is still in the picture up until this point, but then he promises them, he gives them an instruction, right? So they're coming together, they're all together. And Jesus tells them, you know, um, don't leave. He gives them an instruction. Do not depart Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the father. What is this promise? The same promise he'd been talking about in the previous chapters, wait for the Holy Spirit, wait for the Holy Spirit for power, right? He tells them in, in, in um, verse eight, he says, but you shall receive the power, we shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I think in the, watch, in the gathering of watch women, we've been talking about, um, you know, watching, waiting, right? And warning. So there's importance, there's, there's, it's really important to wait if they were premature in, in moving forward um, and say, oh, wow, we've seen Christ, we've experienced Christ, now let's just go do it, right? We were, we were afraid before now, we've received Christ, we know we can go. They will have perished, you know, they wouldn't have um, been able to fulfill the assignment. So there is a purpose, there's a purpose for waiting. And that purpose is to wait for power, wait for the Holy Spirit, the spirit of power. And that power is for a purpose. In the second part of verse eight, it says, and you shall be witnesses to me. So Jesus is saying, wait for the whole, wait, uh, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, semicolon, and you shall be witnesses to me. So the power is for a purpose, to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. So for everyone, no matter what your purpose is, what your God-given vision or assignment or whatever is, your inherent purpose, the inherent purpose of God's plan for your life is evangelism, right? Is to propagate the gospel, 
So you can say, oh, God has called me to be a nurse. God has called me to be a musician. Well, that's wonderful and great, bro. Why? So that the glory, uh, the knowledge of his glory will fill the earth, as it, as it says in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. So wait for, let's wait, let's learn how to wait for um, for power um, so that we can be, um, we, we can move forward in what God has called us to do. Um, how to wait? How do you wait? We've been waiting, right? We've been gathering, the gathering of, of watch women um, in on Zoom has been our upper room, essentially, right? That is how you wait. It, we it tells you right there, you know, it's, it's wonderful about in the word of God, just, um, you know, if you're looking for a pattern or a, a blueprint, it's right there. It says that, that they waited in the upper room, right? So there's probably in the temple, in the upper room, they were secluded. They were not just or oh, in a sanctuary, they were in a seclusion. Again, your private, um, your private meeting place with God. And they continued in one accord. It says in um, verse 14, these all, so it, tell, it tells, says all the, um, the names of the disciples and it says, these all continued with one accord. Unity, again, remember Jesus prayed for unity. He prayed for unity over and over and over again. So unity is key to the move of the spirit of God. Unity is key to experiencing the power of God. Unity in your home, with your spouse, in the church of God, and wherever you are with other believers. And it says there that um, they continue with one, with one accord in prayer and supplication, right? Uh, Philippians 4, 6 tells us, you know, be anxious for nothing, but in all prayer, with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, make your request known to God. But there's a difference. If you didn't know, there's a difference between prayer and supplication, right? Prayer is, you know, communicating with God, but supplication, which, you know, you can pray, you can do this and that, but supplication is actually like pleading humbly, kneeling down, bowing, entreating God with definite requests. What was their request? right? They, they had a promise. So they were like, okay, we're waiting. God, we want the power. We want the power. So when you're waiting, you are, you are pleading, you're entreating God for power. You're entreating him for his wisdom, for insight. So you have to tarry in the room of prayer, tarry and, and you know, tarry and supplicate with supplication, right? So it's so important that we just not say we're waiting on God, right? And, and this is when we say we're waiting on God, we're fasting, but we don't really wait. We go and we just say a quick um, five minute prayer and we go, but really waiting on God is entreating him with requests. Now, in accordance to his will, right? You're not praying your heart. You're praying the heart of the father. Remember the promise. What are the prophecies that have been, has been spoken over your life? And we see here in chapter two, so that comes here comes the spirit of power. Um, what was really interesting that I found out, so the day of the Pentecost eventually came, right? Verse one says, when the day of Pentecost came, had fully come, they were all with one accord. So they, they according to what I read, my research, so this was the day of Pentecost came 50 days after resurrection. So remember, Jesus had promised them before um, the resurrection, before he died, that the spirit, the Holy Spirit will come. After he died, uh, when he rose again, he, you know, he told them to wait, right, in chapter one. And then 50 days after, so there were days after, it wasn't just a few hours, they were with one accord, in one place, right, with, of one mind. And, the, and then there was a performance. So we should wait, we should never be in a hurry when we're waiting for power, when we're waiting to see God move, wait until there's a performance. Don't be in a hurry to leave. Don't be quick to just be like, okay, God, I've prayed once and I'm done. You know, God, you know, God hears, right? God hears. I don't need to repeat myself. He even knows my heart. Why should I even pray? But he's saying him that we should pray. We should wait. We should, you know, you know, come to, with to him in prayer and supplication until there's a performance, right? It may be two days. It may be five days. It may be 40 days, um, whatever that is. And then verse two, and it says, and suddenly, right? So they were in one accord, um, in prayer and supplication in the upper room until that day came and suddenly there came. So there was no buildup. There was no physical manifestation that anything was happening, that the Holy Spirit was coming. It was just like, boom or whatever, right? And the Holy Spirit just came suddenly, suddenly there was a, um, a, a sound come, a sound, there came a sound from heaven as out of a rushing mighty wind, fill the whole house suddenly. So this tells me that don't, don't be myopic. Don't be so bothered about what you see. And I think this is why it was so important that Jesus 
made it plain and clear to them in the previous chapters that, hey, blessed are those who see, who believe without seeing, right? Because if they were waiting to see the, that the Holy Spirit was on the move, that the Holy Spirit was, was coming, they will have missed it. They will have left. They will have said, oh, we pray. We didn't see anything happen. We prayed for 30 days. What We prayed and fasted for 40 days even. We didn't see it happen. But the key thing here is to continue going. Persist even when you don't see it, right? Persist. There may not be any physical buildup as you're praying for that marriage, as you're praying for that child to be healed. Persist because surely, surely it will come. If God has said it, it will happen. So let's continue. Let's continue. Let's not get tired of praying. And of course, we see here the um, rep, the uh, revelation or the fulfillment of a scripture uh, that is Joel chapter two, verse 28. Um, so of course, you know, the, the disciples are in the upper room, they prayed and the Holy Spirit came upon them. They were speaking in tongues and the, pro the crowd were like, wait, these people, are they not from uh, the Jews from Jerusalem? They're, how come they're speaking my language from X, Y, and Z? But the power of the Holy Spirit, they thought they were drunk. They said, oh, these people are drunk. But Peter said, no, 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 they were, they're not drunk. And let it be known to you. This was what was spoken, right? He was saying, then he recounted the, the, the prophecy in Joel chapter two, verse 28. It says, it shall come to pass in that day, the last days that I will pour my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. We all know that, right? But the key thing here I want to bring in here is that to partner with the Holy Spirit to bring prophecies into fulfillment in your life. It has been, it was said before, but if the, the apostles or if the disciples did not partner with the Holy Spirit, they didn't wait for the Holy Spirit. They didn't, you know, wait to receive that power. They didn't, um, they were not filled with the Holy Spirit. They weren't given utterance. That scripture will have been fulfilled. So it's a reminder to partner with the Holy Spirit so that every word that has been spoken over your life will come into fulfillment in Jesus name. Okay. And then, um, Let's see here, um, going on in that. So another thing here is to earnestly desire the continuous outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? So Ezekiel, um, in Ezekiel chapter 37, it talks about having the water, the, the river, the river of life that was filled, you know, that, that he was standing up to the ankle in it and then he went up to his waist and at some point he was swimming in it. So we should continue to desire the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that um, we will be given utterance, we'll be, we will have that power. power. That power of the Holy Spirit equips us um, you know, for what to, to deliver, to perform the assignment that God has given to us. Also gives courage and boldness. I mean, so in chapter two, verses 22 to 39, the Holy Spirit, I mean, you know, after they've, they encountered the Holy Spirit and received the Holy Spirit, now the disciples that were shut up in a room were afraid of the Jews. They were now out there, like just putting it on blast. Like, you know, here they were just professing Jesus. Okay, I'm not gonna, I know time is running out. So then also they experienced, after experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit, experiencing the Holy Spirit, they had unprecedented growth. The church experienced unprecedented growth. Um, signs and wonders followed, right? Um, they were not chasing after signs and wonders. They waited for power. And then signs and wonders came followed them after they received the, um, the Holy Spirit. And then salvation, the Spirit of God um, saves. Um, I think it's, it's in verse, chapter four, verse 12, actually also says that there is no other name by which uh, other, uh, there is no, sorry, there's, there, nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which men must be saved jumping ahead of myself, but essentially saying that, that the power of God will save you waiting on the Holy Spirit um, will, will deliver you from a lot of headaches. And um, verse, chapter three talks about the healing of the layman. So again, signs and wonders followed after they received the Holy Spirit. Peter and John went out. They came across the lame man. What did they do? They acted. Shortly after they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit themselves, they started manifesting. They healed the lame man and glorify God. So know that God's calling, auction, and anointing upon your life is not just so you can um, be and just showcase it, just say, oh, I can do this. But God has anointed each and every one of us. He has called us for a reason. And you have to operate in that. You have to operate. You have to act and do. I guess some, you know, I, I read somewhere some time ago that, you know, if the apostles didn't act, right? They received the unction, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If they didn't operate due practice, there was no way there was going to be manifestation. So this man that was lame could not have received this healing if they didn't practice. So again, if you come across somebody that's sick, 
take time to pray for them. You just, you don't know when you'll be able to raise the dead if you don't practice. Again, it's all for the glory of God. And Peter and John did return all the glory back to God. But in doing so, they were arrested um, for healing the name man in the name of Jesus, right? So this is that scripture I was quoting before that, um, nor is there salvation under in any other, right? It's the name of Jesus that saves. It's the name of Jesus that heals. And they continue to profess that name of Jesus with boldness, we were told. These were uneducated, untrained, untrained men, but they spoke succinctly. They spoke precisely to the point because they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So while yes, education is so important, but look, it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter where you're coming from, what you have, what you don't have. When the Holy, when you have the power of the Holy Spirit, you will be empowered to do the needful. You will be empowered with boldness. Um, and so what did Peter and John face? They were arrested. And what did they do when they were persecuted? And right, they were brought before, brought before the high priest and such. Um, I have a couple more minutes here. They were brought before the high priest, um, the Sanhedrin, and they asked them, so by what power or by what name have you done this? And they said, um, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Fast forward, um, they, you know, then they were like, okay, what do we do to these people? Um, and so, the, so what, did, what happened? So they said, go, don't do it anymore. So they went. And Peter and Paul went to the disciples in verse 22. It says, being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that had happened. So they, they heard that. When they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God. You know, they went on. And then that's where they quoted the scripture. Why do the nations, nations rage and the people plot vain things? Um, you know, like saying basically who can stand against God. So when you're, when you're persecuted, when you are facing challenges, what is your response? Are you complaining? Are you saying, God, give me the grace, give me the boldness, give me the strength to persist. So they prayed, right? So they came together, they prayed, the place shook. Again, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, um, not emphasizing the importance of continuous outpouring of the Holy Spirit for more power, for greater grace, for greater boldness. And we saw that they continued, they, I mean, they continued on in the great works that they were doing, regardless of what they were facing, because the Holy Spirit empowered them. And so a reminder here that when God is backing you, no one can stand against you, right? Who can stand against God? No one. So that when you, when you wait on God, when you um, persist in prayer, the undeniable power of God will be evident in you and through you. And of course, in chapter five, the famous story of Ananias and Sapphira, husband and wife, right? The two shall become one um, in purpose and everything. Unfortunately, this one were one in purpose of something not to be, um, uh, they were one in, for, for the wrong purpose. So um, at this point in time, and you know, the, the church grew, Bar and people were sharing, Barnabas and others were sharing in all things. And so they decided to go and sell um, was it their, their plot of land or whatever it was, a, a, some property. And they, they decided to lie to the Holy Spirit. Of course, they were smitten dead. My point here is you are a help me to your spouse. Don't enable them in wrongdoing. If you see them doing wrong, you know, correct them in love, you know, pray for them, but don't enable that because that can lead to their demise and yours. God forbid. As you know, it says in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, iron sharpens iron, so one sharpens another. Don't dull your spouse, sharpen your spouse, okay? Um, don't you don't dull your friend. This is not just about husband and wife, but for those that are married, your friends, even if you are married, your friends, your sisters, don't don't enable anyone's wrongdoing. Okay. And of course, the integrity of your heart. For them, they they wanted to show that, okay, yes, we two were we are in one accord. They weren't forced, okay. They were it was not by compulsion that they had to go and sell their property but they and, and that wasn't sin if you don't give it's not sin but when you give with the wrong intention right then that becomes sin integrity of your heart is more precious to god than your outward acts of worship this is why we should not mistake we should not mistake in relationship with god with service with um you know doing this busyness just make sure your heart is always right with God. Give, give with the right heart if you're going to do so. Don't give publicly so that everyone would know, so that they will give you credit. Do it, do it cheerfully and do it as unto God. <clears throat> we'll continue on in that. Um, we see again here that, of course, um, the power of God continued to, um, the church of God continued to grow. <clears throat> they continued to, uh, what stood out was that Peter, 
um, and, and the apostles, they didn't stop there, right? They didn't stop. Oh, we have power. We can heal. That's it. They continued to wait. They continued to wait in verse 12. It says, and through the hands of apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. This was where they were before. So again, you have to continue. You have to persist. You have to continue to wait for power. There's a new power for different level that you're in. The power that you needed yesterday to um, to, to heal a headache is going to be, it's going to be small, pale in comparison to the power you need for that new level to raise the dead. Again, signs and wonders followed as they waited for power. And of, and of course, you know, when, when you're destined for greatness, the enemy will have a target. You basically are wearing a target on your back. The enemy, you know, the, the, the Sadducees, they found them, they, you know, they rose up against them, but they did not prevail. What happened? They, uh, they at night, so they were arrested and thrown into prison. The, the angel opened the door for the apostles and they pretty much walked out. No one knew, right? So this is better than the SEAL team or what anyone else could do. Because when the SEAL team, they blow things up and you see evidence, but this one, they just escaped. No one knew like a thief in the night. Um, again, what did they do when they were, when this happened, they um, continued, they continued, they were put on trial again, um, but they continued, they persisted. And at some point they said, you know, they addressed the people, um, and it says, should we fear men? Should we all, when it says in verse 29, but Peter and apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Oh my gosh, I've overshot my time. Just a couple more slides. It says, um, we ought to obey God rather than men. We ought to fear God. So when you're facing um, challenges, when you're caught, when you feel like your back is against the wall, you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Don't worry about men. Don't worry about their faces. Don't worry about your reputation, what they will say. Let it go, right? Christ has already warned you. You will face persecution. You will face this. You will pay, face that. But you need to remain constant, remain in persistent obedience. And they did that. And daily in the temple, in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching. Remember, he told them, you will be witnesses to me. So they persisted in their assignments. They persisted in the call of God upon their lives. And then um, chapter six, we see here the seven chosen to serve. Um, of course, Stephen was one of them that was highlighted, but um, here just a reminder that serving God is, is a privilege, right? When you're serving God, you're not physically seeing God. Yes, I'm serving in his house. I was teaching in DKZ. I, like, I just say that because I'm reminded that I have, I'm teaching tomorrow. How is teaching in DKZ serving God? Well, you're serving his people. You're teaching his children. You're, you know, in your home. How am I serving God? You're serving his people. And when you serve God, always keep in the forefront of your mind. It's not about the people. Do it as unto God and not unto man. So when, when it seems like somebody is giving you um, I don't know now, uh, it, you know, someone is giving you X, Y, and Z to complete, right? Those SOPs that need to be turned in, right, folks? Um, and because you're serving, you're like, ah, what is this? Is it my, is this my own? I didn't kill Jesus. I'm just, I'm just helping them out in church. No, don't, don't let that be your attitude. Have an art, um, the attitude of a servant. Do it unto God, not as unto man. Know that you're serving his purpose by serving his people, do it with the right heart. Again, serving is a privilege. And we see that Stephen, um, the requirements for service was what? Um, full, to be full of faith in the Holy Spirit. So to really serve God, um, to serve him well, to be a good steward, you have to be full of the Holy Spirit, which is a spirit of power. And you have to be full of faith because God is going to, uh, um, you, know, you know, God, you, first of all, without faith, you can't please God. And secondly, if you look as it relates to the, the apostles and when they received the Holy Spirit, they received the power of the Holy Spirit, they had to move by faith to perform those signs and wonders. So you're chosen to serve so that, you know, you will indeed by doing, by serving and receiving, by receiving the Holy Spirit, you have his power. You will be able to do signs and wonders, but you also need to be full of faith so that God can work through you. Holy Spirit causes the power inside of you. He wants to work through you, but you need to be full of faith. So Stephen was a, um, was a man full of faith and power, right? In verse eight, but it was the power of, of the Holy Spirit given to him by and through the Holy Spirit. And he did great signs and wonders so much so that they, he, was, um, he was challenged, but he spoke with irresistible wisdom of the Holy Spirit um, in front of the, um, the high priest. And then he gives his... Um, his address. So this was essentially like the longest sermon in the in the in the testament. It was basically recounting, chronicling um, what had happened to the children of Israel. He was charged against blasphemy. They were like, "How can you be? How can you be saying these words? You know, against God and Moses." Blah blah blah. 
And then he recounted, he said, okay, let me tell y'all some history here. Um, you know, it says that he recounted all these things, right? Talks about the promises of Abraham and, you know, how Israel went away from God and then saying that we are now the tyrannical of God, right? It also reminds us in, in Revelations 21, 3, that God has not chosen us. He's, dwelt, he's chosen to dwell among his people as his tabernacle. He says all these things, but if he didn't abide in God, Christ, if he didn't abide, let the word abide in him right? He wouldn't have been. And if it wasn't filled with the love of God to be able to stand, um, you know, you know, to be able to, you know, propagate the gospel, he wouldn't be doing this. So a reminder to abide in, you know, abide in Christ, let his word abide in you, be uh, abide in his love, be filled, wait for his power so that you can receive the boldness to do what he has called you to do. I want to point out something here. This is my la last slide, but, um, Okay, I want to read um, um, chapter seven, verse four. Um, I'll start from verse three. This is basically was saying, uh, talking about Abraham, that God said to him to get out of the country from your father's relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Verse four says, then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in there. And verse five says, and God gave him no inheritance in it, right? God told him to leave his father. He left. He came to the land of Chaldeans. He dwelt there, but God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on it. And it says, but even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give him, like God promised to give it to him for possession and to his descendants after him. So what I was, I mean, this is not part of this, but one time I was reading the scripture and what dawned on me was like, wait, God didn't, he didn't give, he told this guy to live his family leave everything. And he, he was operating. He did everything on a promise, on a promise. So for someone today, God is telling you to take a big step. Is this promise good enough for you? He has spoken to you, but for Abraham, that was why he was counted righteous because God's promise was good enough. So let the promise of God be good enough for you. Um, act on it, act on the faith and God will make everything um, that he has spoken over your life come to accurate fruition in Jesus name. Um, that is all I have. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts, any questions this morning. Any thoughts, any questions at all? Thank you, Pastor Shun. That was awesome. Sorry. Oh my gosh, I ran over by seven minutes. Oh, it's not bad. No. Anyone have any questions? Any thoughts? Any thoughts? Any yeah. Hmm. I think it was so good. Morning. Go ahead, Anna. Go ahead, Anna. Good morning, everyone. Um, no, I just wanted to say, just looking at the disciples, especially uh, Peter, from where he started from and where I guess he ended up in the book of Acts, it's just mm -hmm. encouraging to me um, to not give up on my journey. Um, to even though, like, some days I feel weak and feel like, okay, like, I'm not growing or like, what am I really doing? Um, or feel like a powerless Christian. Like it just kind of encourages me to see that, you know, it's a journey and um, it's not about where you started from, but it's about where uh, you're going or where God takes you. Uh, so I just get encouraged just looking at, at Peter, especially to see how powerfully he became like a mighty man of uh, uh, for God and an oracle for God to, to you. So it encourages me that there's hope for me. <laughs> there's Amen. hope. Yeah. Amen. That's great. That's, that's a, a, it's a reminder for us too, right? Like for you point out a really good, um, that was a really good point rather, because you look at him before and after it was like, he was timid. He denied Christ. He was, you know, kind of shut behind closed doors. And then by, you know, persisting, right. And the persisted and, the you know he his anchorages right where even his anchorages were healing people so let's continue on let's not get weary Amen. Amen. i think that is i think that is all okay so jodian go ahead and pray us out if you don't mind okay. we'll do we'll do um dear heavenly father god we thank you for your word god we thank you for what we've learned about you today, God. We thank you, God, for what we've learned about the Holy Spirit, God. We thank you, God, for what we've learned about just our journey with you, Heavenly Father, and just the sacrifice that you've made 
for us, Lord, let us never forget the price that you paid for us to have the freedom that we have right now, God, and the freedom that we continue to walk in, God. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray, dear God, that each day as we read your word, Heavenly Father, you'll continue to reveal who you are to us who we are to you, Heavenly Father, and how you you continually work mightily in our life. Lord, we commit this day in your hands and we glorify you in the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Amen, amen. 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 Thank amen. you ladies for joining. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Thank you, Pastor Sharon. Thank you, ladies. Bye.